Hey everyone, welcome back to Adhering Apologetics. As always, we're brought to you by you with your support on Patreon.com. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John Walton. He's an Old Testament scholar and professor at Wheaton College. He specializes in the ancient Near Eastern backgrounds of the Old Testament, especially with regards to the creation stories and also dabbles in the book of Job. So, John, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Great to be here with you, Zach. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, it should be so much fun. Um, and you're, you're one of the more renowned Old Testament scholars out there. So I'm really excited to talk with you about the book of Genesis and just a lot of like the basic like questions about what's going on here. And then some of like the big questions regarding specific things. Um, so to start off, could you talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do? Okay. Well, as you mentioned, I'm a professor at Wheaton College. I've been here 20 years. Uh, the 20 years before that, I spent teaching at Moody Bible Institute. I was raised in a Christian home um, and uh, began my pursuit of uh, Old Testament as a career in um, my college days. Uh, I was originally an economics major um, and then realized that there was uh, an academic field available in Old Testament and immediately started heading in that direction. So I did my graduate work at Wheaton. I did my PhD uh, at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. A Jewish school and got my training with some rabbis there and other Jewish professors. Mm -hmm. So then I went right to Moody and yeah, have spent my last 40 years teaching and writing and dealing with uh, students and teaching in the church, etc. That's awesome. So what got you interested in like Genesis and studying like the creation account and the origins and things along that line? Well, early on in my graduate work, I became aware of how significant ancient Near Eastern study could be. Not just archaeology, that has its own significance, but actually ancient Near Eastern literature and how that could help us get a window into the ancient world in which the Israelites lived. And so I got very interested in that and began pursuing it. Uh, And of course, once you do that, Genesis is one of the first uh, first things on the radar. So I ended, I've ended. i ended up spending a lot of time in Genesis through the years as I did comparative studies and uh, again, wrote a commentary on Genesis and things of that sort. Mm, that's awesome. So we're going to be diving in a lot to the book of Genesis here. Um, and I figured to start off, we could just kind of lay the groundwork. So as I was composing questions, I'd like, you know, I was thinking about like, oh, who, what, where, when, why, all those things. Um, and then like some of the more specific things. So just to start off, like, um, at least in your view, like who wrote the book of Genesis? Where um, this book, when we get the Bible, um, the, the first book of our Bible, where does it come from? Like who wrote uh, the book of Genesis? Well, we wish we knew, <laughs> but unfortunately the book does not tell us. And the rest of the Bible does not tell us, mm-hmm. and therefore we really don't know. But beyond that, that level of, well, it just doesn't give us the information, in one sense, the question itself can be problematic. Um, we tend to think of the books in our Bible as, well, books that have authors and a point in time at which they were written. That says a lot more about our world than it says about their world. Uh, In the ancient world, Israel included, people were hearing dominant, not text dominant. Uh, This doesn't just have to do with literacy, although most people could not read and write uh, beyond any basic level, if that. Uh, But it has to do with how culture functioned. Mm. And so the idea of hearing dominance is that they were used to receiving their information uh, through people speaking. And that means that the first inclination was not to write. After all, if people can't read, then what do you gain by writing? There was writing, of course. There were scribes who did writing, and the things they wrote were put in archives, but it wasn't like a library that anybody could go and take out something and read it. And therefore, the first inclination was not to write things. Uh, There were things written, but much of the transmission of the traditions like those found in Genesis, would have been conveyed orally over centuries and centuries, perhaps before somebody wrote them down. And we wouldn't know who that was who did that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, some people may kind of think that like, you know, Jesus talks about um, the law of Moses and uh, a lot of people describe the Pentateuch to being like Moses being the author of uh, the first five books of the Bible. So what are your thoughts on like that kind of idea with regards to the authorship of Genesis and the Pentateuch? Uh, 
Well, again, it never really connects Moses to Genesis itself. The mm -hmm. Torah, okay, we can refer to the first five books, the Pentateuch, as the Torah. And that's been a designation for a long time. But the Torah is also that portion that we call the law. And Torah itself is a word that means instruction. And therefore, Torah can mean a number of different things. Uh, Moses is credited with writing the Torah, uh, that section of the Pentateuch that has to do with what he received from Mount Sinai. But there's no indication that he received the stories of Genesis from Mount Sinai. And therefore, that tradition doesn't connect him to the actual writing of the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so moving on to like when uh, you talk about um, a lot of like the content of Genesis, maybe like traditions that are passed along for like um, century to century and such like um, so we're looking at like the composition of the text. There's a lot of different stories going going around here. But if you're like kind of like dating the composition of the book of Genesis, like what, what do you kind of think of from your perspective? I wish I knew. See, I'm using <laughs> the same answer over and over. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I knew. Uh, it, when we look at Genesis 1 through 11 and the content of that and look through the rest of the Old Testament, you find out that Genesis 1 through 11 is largely missing. Hmm. They don't refer back to those stories. They make a passing reference to the Garden of Eden in Ezekiel, um, passing reference to the Tree of Life in Proverbs. But... Uh, Little mention of uh, the Garden of Eden as the place where these trees were, where the fall took place. Uh, no reference to the flood, no reference to the Tower of Babel, no reference to Cain and Abel. Hmm. And so, again, it becomes difficult to say at what point are the Israelites aware of these narratives? We'd like to think that they are aware of them all the way through, and they may well have been. I've got no problem with that. But if we're looking for that evidence in the rest of the Old Testament, you're not going to find very much to help you out. Now, that means that theoretically, the final step, remember, I talked about the idea that the first inclination was not to write. Hmm. Okay, so writing took place gradually along the way, sometimes maybe in documents, individual documents, the story of Joseph or something like that. Um, and then at some point, somebody came along and combined all of those documents and oral traditions into what we call the book of Genesis with its own purpose. But we don't know when that took place. Again, there's no indication of it taking place. There are indications in the book of Genesis that that was a long, gradual process. For instance, comments like, and in those days, the Canaanites were in the land. Oh, mm -hmm. so we must be writing at a later time yeah. when they weren't. Um, you know, But this was before the Israelites had kings. So that gives some reflection from a later time period. But we really don't know when that all came together. We know that by the time of the Qumran documents, our earliest major archive of scripture, uh, second century at the earliest, uh, we know that by then the book had come together. But when that happened, we really don't know. Wish we did. Mm, yeah, it would be amazing to kind of see how that process all worked out. Um, so maybe to a little bit questions where we may have a little bit more of an idea of perhaps um, the question of like, why was Genesis written? Um, we have this book that's assembling all these um, amazing stories of God's truth that comes along. But like, why was the book of Genesis like composed and written? And it's kind of a very broad question. Um, but, like, what, what's your kind of your take on like why the book of Genesis was written? I'll, I, I won't give the same answer I gave for the <laughs> other two, but it's not a lot different. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it doesn't tell us. Mm. Okay, that's different from saying I wish I knew. It doesn't yeah. tell us, but that means that we have to infer it, deduce mm. it. We have to read the book and figure out what is it that holds all these parts together. You know, wh why do you have Genesis 1 through 11 and then 12 through 50? Why does it go through the patriarchal ancestral narratives the way that it does? Why does it? And, and all we can do is observe the selection and arrangement and emphasis. And from those observations that we can make as readers, we can try to deduce what the purpose was. Now, uh, I think that we can make a pretty good shot at that. And 
because of the nature and the amount of the information that we have. Uh, so I think that we can conclude that the book was written to give an introduction to the covenant. Mm -hmm. And so Genesis 12 through 50, of course, has the establishment of the covenant, but it still launches you then into Exodus rather than concluding the story uh, at the end of Genesis. Um, it's like, a, you know, if you're trying to read a, a novel and suddenly the novel ends and it drops you in the middle of something and you say, oh no, I have to buy the next <laughs> one to find out. Well, yeah, the, the, there's a precedent for that. Genesis does it. So mm. that's clearly about the establishment of the covenant. Uh, the Genesis 1 through 11, of course, doesn't have anything to do with Abraham's covenant, but it does show you how what was happening in history that brought the covenant about, okay? And for that, you need to talk a little more about the, the covenant and its significance, which I assume we'll get to eventually. But mm. that's what I would understand the book being written for, to give us an introduction to the establishment of the covenant. Mm. So let's talk about um, some of these like main ideas that come out in Genesis. You mentioned like the covenant, and then you have like kind of like the division between like one through eleven and twelve through fifty. You got all these like really interesting things going along in the book of Genesis. So what are like some of like the main ideas that are in the book of Genesis that you bring out? Obviously, as a scholar who's written commentaries and spent your life kind of studying this book. To me, the main idea is about God's presence. Mm. Uh, most people don't see that in Genesis 1 because they get to day 7 and says God rested and they say what? Like <laughs> what's up with that? That doesn't make any sense. God doesn't get tired and, and so they just move on. Um, what we easily fail to understand is an ancient Near Eastern connection that when God's rest, they rest in temples. And when God rests, it doesn't mean he disengages, although that word Shabbat in, Gen in seventh day does mean to cease. But Exodus 20 makes it clear that he doesn't just cease, that when he rests, using a different word now, Nuach, when he rests, he is ruling. He is taking mm -hmm. up his rule. He's not resting in a bed. He's resting on a throne as he sits down to take control of this cosmos that he has ordered. I deduce from that, that the very reason God created us was to be in relationship with us and dwell among us. Mm -hmm. And creation is setting that up. And of course we see that in chapter two, where there he is, God's dwelling among the people that he created in relationship with them. That's what he did it for. And then, of course, they lose that relationship in chapter three when they decide that instead of getting on board with God's program for ordering the cosmos, which is what he created them for in his image, they are to work alongside him as vice regents, bringing about order, subduing and ruling. And instead of doing that to bring about his order, they decide, you know, we'd like to do order our own way. Welcome to humanity. And so they end up, you know, God says, basically not in my backyard. And so they end up out of the garden where there they go, trying to do order their way. Order, of course, is connected to God's presence. God is the source of order and the center of order. And therefore, God's presence is a place of his order. That's what the Garden of Eden was. It was all very good. It was ordered. Okay, but now people are trying to establish order on their own. They get to the point in chapter 11, Tower of Babel, where they say, you know, we would like God back down here. Mm -hmm. And so they build the tower. It's not a tower for them to go up. That's been badly misunderstood. Um, ancient Near Eastern material makes it clear that ziggurats were for gods to come down and establish their presence. And that's what the people want. They would love to have the presence of God, but the problem was the presence of God is supposed to be so that God's name might be honored. They want to do it so that, you remember the passage, 
their name might be honored. They're still doing it on their own terms for their own benefits, not on God's terms for what he wants it to be. So God rejects that initiative. So that's where Genesis 1 through 11 gets you from setting up order, from people choosing their own path to order, showing how badly that went, including the flood, the attempt to bring God's presence back, and God rejecting that initiative. That's the launch into chapter 12, because chapter 12 now represents God's counter-initiative. Okay, is he going to establish a relationship based on human benefit, chapter 11, dwelling among them? No, he's going to establish it, dwelling among them and being in relationship with them on his terms. That's the covenant. Mm. So the covenant and the Tower of Babel are balancing on that fulcrum of how the book of Genesis is laid out. And so the covenant then becomes the key theme for how God is establishing relationship, number one, with the intention of restoring his presence. That part doesn't come in Genesis. That's the carryover to Exodus, where we start with God not being present. There they are in Egypt. Where's God? What's up? What's he done? Has he abandoned his people? And then God's presence being gradually revealed, burning bush, plagues, Mount mm -hmm. Sinai, all the way through until God descends to take up his residence in the tabernacle, his presence reestablished. Mm -hmm. with order in his presence set up by means of the Torah, which he gave them on Sinai. So that's kind of how Genesis fits in with Exodus, mm -hmm. with the major theme of God's presence and covenant and how those factors fit together. That was a little long. Sorry for the long answer. No, no, it's great. It, it, there's so much great content. When I ask you for the theme of one of the most important um, texts in all of humanity, it's kind of hard to summarize it all in just a few minutes. So no worries there. I'm curious, I believe like Michael Heiser's view um, is kind of like when we look at like the fall and like, why is there evil and things like that? He looks as it like a lot of times we think it's just like the fall and like Genesis two or Genesis three, um, the fall of man. But then he also would say that things like the Tower of Babel and, and the Nephilim story play a major big impact on like evil in the world and like why is there evil and stuff and such. So I'm curious, like if you're familiar with his view, like do you kind of like sympathize sympathize with that? Where um, like why is there evil is a much more um, complex question that doesn't just involve the fall, even in like Genesis. I'm familiar with his work. We're friends, and I respect the work that he does, and we agree on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly see Genesis or the Old Testament in terms of the uh, creation, fall, redemption sort of narrative. Mm. Okay. Uh, so I don't, I don't see that as a meta narrative that is well established in the Old Testament itself. Certainly, we can mm -hmm. look back on it and see those elements. So I'm not inclined to think that Genesis is talking about how did we get evil. Uh, how did evil come along? Uh, I think that rather than the issue of moral evil, which is a thing, but that rather they're talking about the ordered world and how the ordered world became disordered. Mm. Um, and certainly moral evil is part of that. But I'm not sure that I see the texts in Genesis uh, and in the rest of the Old Testament, developing that. Notice that the prophets never go back to the fall. Neither Old Testament nor New Testament call it the fall. Mm. Okay, and the prophets never go back to it. They talk about how Israel has violated the covenant, not how mm. humanity has fallen from grace. Hmm. So uh, I try to look at things, first of all, from the text in context, the Old Testament context. There's room later on to talk about theology and New Testament and Augustine and all of those things. But I always want to start with text in context and try to see how they are viewing it. Mm. Yeah, context is such an interesting thing and such an important thing to think about um, with regards to this. I do have some specific questions for you that we'll get into in just a moment. But as you brought up the idea of context, um, you do a lot of work in studying not just Genesis, but the ancient Near East. Like how important do you think is understanding the context of the ancient Near East and kind of when we understand, when we try to like understand and look at like the text of Genesis and what it's saying? Uh, 
Well, that's that's similar to the question, how important is it to know about the Hebrew text mm. or just read English? Mm -hmm. And lots of people know that they're never going to learn Hebrew. Um, and maybe they don't like that. <laughs> maybe they did. Maybe, I don't know. But, but they realize that knowing Hebrew can give insights that you can never get from reading the English. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with ancient Near East. Just as Hebrew provides the linguistic context, ancient Near East provides the cultural context. Mm -hmm. The text was originally written in Hebrew. The text was originally written in an ancient Near Eastern context. And therefore, uh, studying Hebrew or studying the ancient Near East, both can give us new insights, sometimes at a pretty technical low level of significance, but sometimes, you know, nine on the Richter scale that can mm. really make a difference. Yeah. I mean, I've mentioned a couple examples already, how we've thought about ziggurats as going up, us people going up instead of God coming down. You wouldn't know that without the ancient Near Eastern information. Talk mm. about resting in temples. Now that one you could know if you read Psalms 134 about God resting in temples and it being his resting place. So you could get that one, but people didn't typically apply that to Genesis. And again, it's the ancient Near East that gives us that. So in some passages, it can make a dramatic difference. Others, it's a little detail here or there. Mm. Yeah, and this is awesome. So let's dive into some of these specific questions. One is, um, like, in your view, what's going on with the creation story? Um, you know, there's all kinds of different views, and a lot of people will say that maybe the text of Genesis is um, guiding a specific model of, like, how God created, maybe in terms of, like, chronology. Like, you have, like, the old earth, young earth debate and the theistic evolution debate and all those kind of debates about, like, what this story is saying um, in the first few chapters of Genesis. So in your view, like, what is this whole creation story about? And is it, like, is it supposed? Posing a certain view about like the origin of the universe and humanity and such? Well, if we're going to understand the biblical text through the eyes of its author, who is the one that God vested with authority, by the way, so we want mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. Then we should ask what kind of creation narrative they are trying to tell. You can tell the creation story a lot of different ways. One example I use. Um, is that if you walked into a play late and sat down in your seat, you're a half hour late, it's already going on, and you poked the person next to you and asked, how did the play begin? There are several different ways they could answer that question. They could talk to you about when the script was written. Oh, but no, that's not what you want. But of course, you can't have a play without a script. They could talk about when the theater was built or when the set was constructed. No, no, that's not what you want. You can't have the play without the set and the stage and all of that, but that's not the question you're asking. They could talk about how the cast was selected and what they were looking for. Great information, but that's not what you want. All of those answers would be accurate. They would all appropriately describe how the play began. So you could tell the story of how the play began numerous true ways. Those wouldn't conflict with each other. And you wouldn't have to tell all of them. You could tell whichever one was of interest. At that point, your interest is what's happened since the curtain opened. And that also would be an appropriate answer. And some people would say, well, that's not a very good answer. You haven't talked about when the set was built and you can't have the play without the set. Well, ju just hold on. The person who asks gets to tell you what kind of thing they want. And so when we read Genesis, we can't be content to say, what is the creation story we would want in our day with our scientific questions and our theological perspectives? What, what would we want? We don't have that privilege. We get the story they want to tell. And again, it could be a very different story than what we want. That would not make it less true. It would just be a different story. And so when you ask a question like, what's going on in the creation story, right? That's like asking, how did the world begin? And you could answer that many ways. And when we start, and when we start that by asking about evolution and science and Big Bang and this and that, you can see that we're imposing our desired story on their text. We don't want to do that. 
we want to read their text. Another way yeah. I've described another way I've described it is that when we think about science, we think about creation as a house story, building the house, the house being the universe, the cosmos, the world, and everything. Mm -hmm. Right? We think of it as building a house. God is manufacturing physical objects. That's the inclination of our world, our culture, our, our perspective. That's one way you could answer the story. Creation could be a house story, but creation could also be a home story. Mm -hmm. Making a home is an act of creation. It's a very different act of creation than building a house, but it's a legitimate account of creation. Making a home has a very different perspective and objective than a house story would have. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to ask the story of Genesis, is it a house story or is it a home story? I'm inclined to think it's a home story. Lots of people would say, well, can't it be both? My answer is yes, it could be both. But we can't just say, I want it to be both because I want a house story. Sorry, you don't get the pick. So I look for evidence in the text that it is a home story or a house story or both or neither, mm -hmm. something else. I want to be driven by the text. Mm. So when you're looking at the text, a lot of people um, may say when they when they read the text um, and granted it may be it come, we have to kind of sort through it like with our cultural lens as well. They'll say that um, there's a conflict here between like um, this creation account and what maybe would be brought about by like evolutionary science because um, you know there's like the de novo creation of Adam and Eve. Um, a lot of people would say with like the Genesis event and there's a conflict here between this creation story um, and what evolutionary theory may say. So in your view is there that conflict or are we just maybe reading Genesis in the wrong way? Is there something else going on here? Well, let's think about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we ask if there's a conflict, we're asking whether they make conflicting truth claims. And if you're going to find out if they're making con conflicting truth claims, you have to know what truth claims each one is making mm -hmm. and what they're making it about. Okay, so evolution's truth claims are pretty straightforward. It's truth claims about the mechanisms by which people have concluded that the world and people and everything else came to be. It's a discussion of mechanisms, of how things happened. Now, evolution is not and cannot be a discussion of agency. Who did this and why? That's not within their purview and they don't try to do it. It can't do it. Okay, so the truth claims evolution is making have to do with mechanisms. When you turn to the biblical account, you find that it's the opposite. The truth claims the Bible is making have to do with agency. Mm -hmm. God is the one who did it all the way through everything. And why? Why does God create? And the book then talks about his purposes, as I've mentioned, to dwell among people, be in relationship with them. So the Bible's truth claims don't, very specifically, don't have to do with mechanisms. Mm. They have to do with agency and purpose. Evolution's mm. truth claims have to do with mechanisms. They do not have to do with agency. Therefore, they are not making the same sorts of truth claims. Mm. They're not making competing truth claims about the same thing. Now, that doesn't make evolution right. It only says that if it is on target, as many people do think, it would not be incompatible with the Bible. Mm. Now, you mentioned de novo creation of Adam and Eve. Well, again, let's, let's be sure we know exactly what's being claimed. Um, are they... Uh, is the biblical text suggesting a de novo, biological, scientific, genetic, chemical kind of creation? That's science. Is the Bible dealing with science or implying science? I find it very interesting that most people don't know, and of course there's a good reason why they don't know, because our translations don't represent it, that in that phrase in Genesis 2-7, the Lord God created humanity, from the dust, there, there's your de novo statement. Mm -hmm. That preposition from is not there. 
ask anybody who knows Hebrew, it's not there. It's the Lord God created humanity and there's a break there in the text, dust from the earth. There's from, from the earth. Dust is from the earth, not humanity from dust. Hmm. Now, uh, NIV, NRSV have from, many other translations have of, he created humans of the dust. Okay, which is like, maybe saying something a little different, but that's not there either. Okay, what the text says is the Lord God created humanity. Break, dust of the earth. At that point, that is not chemistry or biology or science of any sort. That is identity. We know what that is biblically. People are dust. Dust you are to dust you shall return. You remember that we are just dust. People are dust. Old Testament, New Testament, Moses, David, Paul, who name, you name them. People are dust. That is identity. It's hmm. not mechanism. It's not chemical ingredients. It's identity. That means that in Genesis 2, we have an account of human identity. What we are. Not an account of scientific origins. And I would say it's the same thing in Genesis 1. We do, do not have an account of, of scientific origins of the cosmos. We have an account of cosmic identity. What is the cosmos? It has been ordered by God to serve as a home for people and a place where he intends to dwell with them and be in relationship with them. That's what the cosmos is. Mm. It's so interesting to think about here, and we could think and talk about this forever. Um, so there's so much here, but we do. I do want to fast forward here to the flood because um, this is another one of these big questions that people have: is um, what was this flood like? What's going on here? And then there's the age old question of like, did the flood co cover the whole earth? Did it cover part of the earth? Um, it's interesting because like me growing up in like, my little evangelical bubble, I never knew that there were people that believed that the flood only covered part of the earth. Um, so like, what do you think about like what's going on here in the flood account and stuff, stuff along those lines with that story? Well, I think textually, theologically, it's very clear what the text is talking about. The flood is a recreation account. Mm -hmm. We could track that point by point. Um, that's what it's serving as in the book of Genesis and its theological role. It's a reset button, resetting order. The text doesn't even talk about it in Genesis as God's judgment. Mm -hmm. Everything has become disordered because people are doing it their way. And God is resetting order. Now, for that, you don't need to know how much ground the flood covered. And the mm. text doesn't tell you. And some people say, wait, 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 wait. Chapter 7, read it. It uses this universalistic language, verse after verse after verse at the end of chapter 7. That's important to observe. Question, is that universalistic language supposed to be read rhetorically or scientifically. Now, again, you don't get to just pick the one you like. If the author intended it rhetorically, then follow this, then a literal reading of the text reads it rhetorically. Right? I mean, that's how rhetoric mm -hmm. works. Think about the parables. Parable is a form of rhetoric where you tell the parable. Now, if you said, well, I'm going to read that literally and I'm going to find the Good Samaritan and I'm going to interview him about the, the whole thing. Well, you're not reading the text literally because you're not taking account of its genre and its rhetoric. Literal reading of the text always reads it the way that the author intended it to be read. So before you can claim literal reading, you have to ask whether the author intended this language to be rhetorical in nature. That would be the best reading to account for whatever rhetoric. If he meant it scientifically, fine. But of course, we're not inclined to think that the Bible is speaking scientifically. So what, what are the alternatives here? Well, we have numerous places in the Old Testament. Um, I've documented these in Lost World of the Flood um, that talks about all of this. Numerous places in the Old Testament where universalistic language, 
is used rhetorically in the context of major cataclysms or catastrophes. Think about the famine that uh, Joseph was involved in. Seven years of plenty of food, seven years of famine and drought. And Genesis 41, 57 tells us, all the world came to Joseph for food. Universalistic language in a major catastrophic context. Does anybody try to explain how the American Indians got across the Atlantic or how people from Australia came across and how all the world, every single one of them appeared before Joseph? No one does that. Hmm. They recognize that it's rhetorical. You read Zephaniah chapter one, it describes a total destruction. Birds, beasts, plants, all people, everything universal under heaven. It's talking about the exile and the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon, which didn't include every person, didn't include all the animals. The universalistic language in a context of cataclysm is rhetorical. Lamentations 2, same deal. Time after time, in contexts of cataclysm, universalistic language is used rhetorically. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that the flood was not global, but it does mean that you can't claim the Bible demands that the flood was global. Hmm. If its rhetoric gives other options, then it does not demand it. Now, you might say, so do you think that the flood was local? I didn't say that. Do you think it was regional? I didn't say that. I don't know mm. how, how massive the flood was. It was massive. But I don't know. The text doesn't tell us because all it does is use the rhetoric of universal language, which doesn't tell me how extensive it may have been. Mm. I've got to think it was pretty extensive, but I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. Yeah, thank you for going into that. Um, another one of these more specific questions I have, and probably the last one, um, a couple of things left here before we go to a little bit of live um, Q&A if you have questions or super chats for Dr. Walton. Um, but what is the significance of the division between Genesis 1 through 11 and 12 through 50? You hit on this a little bit earlier, but like just to kind of like talk about it again, like what's the significance of the division here between the two sections of the book? Well, it's the significance between how God's presence First became established, then got lost, uh, order got disrupted, the flood, Tower of Babel, people trying to get it back. Boom. All of this about God's plans and God's purposes and God's um, presence being established. Uh, so that talks about the problem. Genesis 12 through 50 talks about God's solution. Hmm. God's solution to reestablishing his presence on earth. At that point, it's interesting to note his solution is not Jesus Okay, Jesus is going to be God's solution for, for making full relationship possible. But his plan for reestablishing his presence on earth, first of all now, is, that is involved with the covenant. That's how God is going to establish his presence. Then, of course, it's going to be in the tabernacle and in the temple and uh, in Jesus, the incarnation, and in the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and in God's people, the church, and in new creation. I mean, that goes all the way through. Mm -hmm. But in Genesis, uh, the switch from 1 through 11 to 12 through 50 moves us from the problem to the solution. And again, the solution at that point is not salvation. The solution is relationship and presence. Mm, awesome. One last question I have for you, and then we'll answer some live things on our way out, um, is how does Genesis fit into the larger story of the Bible? As you see it from beginning to end, How what, what role does Genesis play in, in the big picture of God's story? Well, I just gave you a hint because <laughs> that, that's that whole idea. Genesis is initiating the idea of God's presence through relationship. That's what the covenant is. That's what mm -hmm. the covenant leads to. Uh, I call it Emmanuel theology, God with us. We know this, 
okay? Mm. But we keep thinking about Emmanuel as if it's just a Christmas story. It's not. Mm. This is God's plan and purpose for the entire world, for the entire history. This is what the Bible is all about. This is what God has always wanted, mm. to be with us in relationship. That's what the Bible tells us. And Genesis launches all of that and gets us on that path. But we often miss it because we didn't know that Genesis 1 had to do with, with God's presence. We didn't know the covenant had to do with God's presence. We didn't recognize all of these things. We were too busy theologizing and, mm -hmm. and playing Augustine. Augustine was great. I'm not criticizing him. But he was taking a particular theological perspective. And so we have to try to understand Genesis' role as in inaugurating this idea, God's purpose of wanting to dwell among us and be in relationship with us. And that is the story of the Bible. Again, that flows through tabernacle and temple. It flows through Jesus. Remember, start in John 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. Tabernacle language there. And then in the upper room, Jesus said, I'm going to go away. And they're crushed. You know, no, you can't do this. Mm. This feels like, you know, the Garden of Eden all over again. God's presence is gone. He says, but don't worry, I'm, I'm going to send the comforter. I'm not leaving you alone. And furthermore, I'm going to prepare a place for you and note the language so that where I am, you may also be. Presence, mm -hmm. relationship. Then you move to Pentecost and Babel is reversed. Everybody hears in their own language and they scatter, but they scatter with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Mm -hmm. And so the church becomes the place of God's presence. This is the rich theology from Old Testament, starting in Genesis all the way through to New Testament and new creation. Because what are the first words of new creation? I will be their God and they will be my people. I will walk among them. Mm. God's presence in relationship. Mm. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do now is for about 10 minutes here before um, Dr. Walton has to go, we're going to go to a little bit of live Q&A. So you have questions or super chats. Be sure to get to those. Um, we have an interesting question here from QRT, which is, how come we Christians don't rely more on Jewish scholarship about how Genesis was taken in, the, in a historical context? Or is it or is it, and it's so embedded, we can't separate it anymore. Um, so interesting question here. And it'd be interesting hear, hearing your response coming from doing your doctorate at a Jewish university. Um, I'll draw the distinction between Jewish and Israelite. Mm. Uh, Jewish, we can talk about the modern Jewish interpretations, but lots of those are tied back into rabbinic, which are already tied into a post-Hellenistic period. Um, and so Jewish scholarship is all about rabbinic interpretation. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm. I'm talking about getting into the ancient Near Eastern world. That is a historical context. More importantly, it's a cultural context. OK, but again, Jewish interpretation doesn't necessarily follow that. Some Jewish interpreters do, but Jewish interpretation doesn't necessarily. And so in that sense, we're just trying to get back to the original Israelite authors. We are accountable to them because, because God vested his authority in them. We mm -hmm. want the authority. They're the door. We've got to go through them. So I'm tethered to them, hanging on because if I want what they intended because that's what has authority. Mm. Awesome. awesome. So, so um, um, we have a question here from uh, Bronson Vaughn, what, which says, um, what is the criteria Dr. Walton uses to determine if language is meant to be hyperbole or literally universal? Um, is it a case by cases thing? So Dr. Walton, um, how do you kind of like try to figure out like when is the text speaking hyperbolically versus literally or, you know, all the different um, questions here? You know, we just have to use every we have to use every tool at our disposal to try to do that. But it's not a sure thing. Um, mm. The you notice that when I identified the rhetorical nature of universalistic language, I tied that to a certain kind of context, right? Universal cataclysm or that kind of idea. I tied it to that kind of context. That gave me the basis for understanding that as sort of a genre convention. Okay, so I used that as the criteria that was somewhat objective uh, to determine that. When we do parables, you know, we understand the rhetorical use of parables because we see them. Right? You know, some people could have perhaps thought that these are real stories with real people. Uh, go find the prodigal son. But, 
we we recognize a genre and then we identify the conventions of that genre as best as we are able. Mm. In, in numerous cases, people could come to different conclusions. So it is very difficult to, to make that decision. But again, mm. remember with the flood, it wasn't that I was proving that the flood was not global. Rather, I was suggesting that because of the possibilities of rhetoric, the Bible does not necessarily demand that it was. And that changes the, the picture. Mm. Awesome. awesome. So another question we have here um, is, what would, what would Dr. Walton say to someone who criticizes his view of Genesis by saying that in the age of empiricism, Genesis, Genesis provides no ver significant verifiable information? Um, so a little bit different, but kind of an interesting question here for you, Dr. Walton. Well, the ancient world isn't empiricist. Mm -hmm. And my approach to scripture is not that I somehow have to prove it to be true. I accept it to be true. I want to read it well, so I want so I can know what is true. Lots of times today, people believe that if they can't prove the Bible true, that the default is that it's false. Uh, the Bible doesn't present itself with the idea that you can prove it to be true. It presents the events, the people, as reality. Um, the fact that we may or may not be able to reconstruct events doesn't therefore make them less true. So I'm after trying to understand the narrator and what they are conveying. Um, I don't expect to be able to verify everything to a, a skeptic's content or satisfaction uh, because those things, for me, I take on faith. Uh, not on ability to prove. It's not fiction until proven realistic. It's true. Full stop. And my yeah. job is not to somehow prove it true. My job is to accept it as God's word and understand the message the authors are giving. Yeah, that's really well thought out. Thank you. Um, so that's about all the questions we have um, re regarding Genesis here. So I'll give a chance for you, Dr. Walton, if you have any kind of like last thoughts, things you want to say um, regarding this conversation or anything else that may have come to your mind, um, feel free now. No, I'm, I'm well, you know, fine to just keep answering questions. Okay. Um, we did have one more question. Um, here um, from Bron Bronson Vaughn, I just discovered, um, which says, um, when does Dr. Walton think the original meaning was uh, distorted or forgotten or mistranslated or however the um, original meaning was made for into the average Christian? Because it seems like a lot of Christians today kind of think that, you know, it's teaching a literal creation account, whether it's a young earth or an old earth. Um, so it may be things that would be different than what you believe regarding this text. Um, so what are your thoughts on this question, Dr. Walton? That's a great question. You know, most generations of God's people, Jewish or Christian or whatever, most generations of God's people are in the process of trying to reappropriate scripture for themselves, for their times, for their situations and circumstances. And that's that's natural. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I like to say scripture is not written to us, but it's written for us. And therefore, appropriation ought to be something that we're interested in. The difficulty is that often in, in, in appropriation, you appropriate it um, as you make um, adjustments or connections, associations with regard to your own culture and your own worldview. And whether that was Byzantine Rome or whether it was medieval France or whether it was the Reformation uh, in Switzerland or whether it's our modern scientific, we tend to try to read it in light of our context. It's not that that's a wrong thing, it's just that it's not the same thing as interpretation. And so we have to be careful what we're doing. So in that sense, what Bronson calls distortion, mistranslated, yeah, some of that takes place, but most of it's um, innocuous. So that is, they, there was no intention to do that. Uh, they just had no way of getting to the ancient world whether it's because of Hebrew or because of no resources or texts to help them do that. And so they made the best of what they had. Um, but, you know, as cultures changed, you know, the ancient Near East of the Old Testament, 
quickly unraveled when the Persians came along. Persian world and culture and religion were very, very different. You had 200 years of Persia, which changes the narrative in a sense, narrative in the sense of how we think about the text. And then mm. Hellenism comes rolling through with Alexander. And again, basic, massive overwash of the culture. And so by the time you get to New Testament, you've already had two major culture changes that have taken place. And in New Testament, Greco-Roman times, they did not understand the ancient world. They had no way to. And culture had changed, again, in two massive ways uh, in the interim. And then, of course, you just rumble through history, whether you're going through the, the Enlightenment or the technological re revolution, whatever it is, questions change and people want to appropriate the text. So um, that's, it becomes foreign to us because culture changes. It's not a surprise that culture changes. It's not a problem that culture changes, but it does. And people have a tendency to try to read the Bible intuitively. But when they do so, they run the risk of imposing their own culture on the text because it's their own culture that is their intuition, not the ancient culture. It's hard work to go back and try to recover the ancient language and the ancient culture. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you for uh, laying that out. Um, we have another question here from Green Zombie, which says, given the view that God inaugurated his earth, the earth is his cosmic temple at a point in time that wasn't the beginning of material creation. Was the earth not God's prior to this moment in time where people not um, made in God's image? So a couple of different questions here, but what do you kind of get from this, Dr. Walton? If there were people prior to Adam and Eve, um, they would not have been in God's image, but that's that's not a great um, concession. Uh, the image of God is not something that has to do with our brain or our physical form or our hope for salvation. The image of God is a function. So subdue so and rule, work alongside God, establishing his order. It's not salvific, it's not moral, it's not physical, it's not mental or psychological. Mm. Okay, so in that sense, it's not a problem if there were people who were not in God's image. As soon as people were given the task of subduing and ruling, working alongside God, then all people had that. Okay, so that's if there were other people, that's how I would respond to that. Um, likewise, with the, if, if there was material creation prior to the seven days, um, the difference is not how the world was functioning as uh, in scientific terms. The question of the, day, the seven days is God ordering it to make it a place where he will dwell alongside of people. It's ordered for that purpose. Now, it could mm -hmm. be that from the very first molecule, or if you want to say from the Big Bang or whatever, that God was working toward that end. But that's what day seven is about. It's not about the Big Bang. It doesn't know about the Big Bang or talk about the Big Bang. It's just talking about the purpose of creation as determined by the agent of creation. And so the earth was uniquely ordered to be a place that would be our home, but it's a B&B, &B, our home where God has hosted us. Mm -hmm to be there with him. And that's what, that's what change is. That's what's different in the seven days. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for one more question here before we wrap up um, from Bronson Vonnegut. It says, um, does Dr. Walton have any books or recommended literature on the cultural context of books like Exodus or Leviticus? Um, so where, where do you, people rec where do you rec recommend that people go um, for the cultural context? Okay. Um, so there's the, Cultural Background Study Bible. This one's NRSV. It's also in NIV. That's kind of the first blush place to go to get cultural context all through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Cultural Background Study Bible. Um, there's more to the ancient Near East. Uh, where's my camera? There it is. <laughs> okay. Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament, a book that I did. 
so that people can come to understand the ancient world better. Okay, specifically, there's a five volume set. Uh, there, you <laughs> there you go. The Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary. This is five volumes. It goes through each book, passage by passage. So Exodus, Leviticus, you could just turn to those sections. You know, here I'm in Exodus. Beautifully illustrated, by the way, fully footnoted. 2,200 illustrations, 23,000 footnotes, five volumes, goes to the whole Old Testament. So those are some of the resources that could help people. Mm. Well, awesome. awesome. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Dr. Dr. Walton, for your time here. Um, it's been it's such a pleasure talking to you. Um, so it's been so much fun. I encourage everyone, you can check out Dr. Walton's book. There will be a link below where you can kind of see everything he's got on there. And if you're new to it here in Apologetics, I'd encourage you to subscribe, leave a like. Um, you can do that through YouTube or podcast, however you're listening. Thank you. And if you enjoy the show, you can support us on patreon.com. So I should hear in Apologetics right now. We're about 80% funded. So I appreciate everyone's support there. You can chip in for as little as a dollar a month. Your support means a lot. Or if you're listening via YouTube, you can just press the join button. Um, but Dr. Walton, thank you so much one last time for your time. You're quite welcome. It's been a pleasure talking about these important things. It's been so much fun. So thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone who's tuned, who's tuned in, Ramon, Finding Truth, Bronson, Green Zombie, everyone else. Have a good one. God bless.